Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study, the study on the, the last Daniel's last vision. Um, this is the, I guess it's the fourth week already on this study. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have here to open your word together. We're thankful for this new week. We ask that your Holy Spirit can work upon our hearts. We pray for this movement and uh, for the things that we discuss here in these studies. We ask, Lord, that of those listening, watching, uh, that the Holy Spirit can speak to them and that you can show us our need of you. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, once again. So um, a couple of points. So I, I did have a discussion with Colin um, over, um, I, I think it was from the Thursday, after the Thursday study. So I, I think I had a discussion with him on Friday, if I remember. Um, so, you know, part of the discussion, and. And Heidi and I were discussing it yesterday when we were going for a walk. You know, the one thing that we don't see this study as is a debate. And we've talked about that before. That is, this is not a debate between me and Colin. But we need to always keep in mind the varying views, um, the view that I have, the view that Colin has, when we're studying these things. So we're studying this for a reason. First, Colin asked us to study this. Now, originally, way back, I can't remember how long ago, I had talked about, you know, one of the things that we need to study and maybe we will study next is Daniel chapter 11. And we ended up instead doing, studying other things. Uh, one was, of course, uh, understanding the lines. So, so we didn't end up doing Daniel 11 at the time. Um, but we're doing it now, and that's at Colin's request. Now, Colin has a different view about how we should, or what things I should talk about. So my view is that we need to, to just go systematically through this information without uh, some particular um, goal in mind, other than to give us the background information to draw conclusions. That is, we have to look at everything. Um, this to me is just the way that I generally study, as I don't study with, you know, trying to prove some point that I have. I try to understand everything that I can about a topic. And that to me is one of Miller's rules. You bring all the scriptures together upon a topic, and then you look at those things together. Now, we, we, we are referring sometimes to what Colin has said about something, because we're looking at the context. We're looking at the problems, some of the, the things that are unresolved. So we've talked about, okay, we have the numbering of, of the kings of Persia. We have different numberings for different reasons. How do we resolve and reconcile those numberings? That's one of them. Um, there's going to be other things that we have to look at. We have to look at Revelation 12, 13, and 17. It is, we need to understand is the pioneer's view correct um, in, in some way, on some level, or were they wrong in how they looked at the different forms of Roman government? Now, I have a view on that, right? My view is that they were correct, but that we've made an application and there's nothing wrong with our application. But we always need to be aware of what it is we're doing. Uh, another point, which Colin and I, Colin and I seem to disagree with about, and and he sort of wanted to, me to ask a question, you know, to people studying. I can't remember exactly how he worded the question, um, so I have to ask him again what what the question was, because it wasn't really, uh, it didn't it didn't stick in my mind what the question was. But part of it has to do with how we look at 
the events that we are in. So I've had the view for a long, long time, this goes back at least to 2017, but I believe earlier, that this movement is Samuel Snow. And in 2017, I came to the view that Samuel Snow's letters were embodying a line of some sort that this movement was in. So that we were in this thing called Samuel Snow's letters that was prefiguring something that's going to happen in the future. And we could talk about it as being internal, that is, it was something internal within this movement. And, and it came as time went on that July 18th, as a prediction, lined up with Samuel Snow's last letter. And um, when we went through that disappointment, we were typifying a disappointment that's still coming. So there is a disappointment that's coming. And we had to experience that disappointment for ourselves in order to understand uh, the first and second angel's messages. So that experience, we had to experience the first two messages. That's what this movement had to do in order to move on and progress in our understanding of this message. So, so I don't believe that we're in the Sunday law on the big line, except in that we are on a zoom in on that Sunday law, that is our history is zooming into that Sunday law, but that Sunday law is still future. And that's not um, a peace and safety message. We're not saying, well, it's just delayed and you can go about, and, you know, sleep a little longer. My belief is that we've been given an additional extension of time. God has given us this time because we have a work to accomplish. And that work includes uniting with our brethren, studying with our brethren, understanding a message, developing a message that we are to give to the Levites. And, and without those three things, I don't believe that this movement can progress. It is unless we can be united with our brethren, um, we're just going to have a divided and fractured movement. So, so however this is going to come about, it's not going to come about by us trying to, you know, unite with our brethren, other than that we need to recognize in ourselves the things that are hindering us in our spiritual walk. That is, we need to be united with Christ. And if we are united with Christ, we will be united with others that are united with Christ. And if all of us do that work, then we will be united. We will be pulling in the same direction, seeing and understanding the same things. So, so that's how, that's what I believe. Now, I don't know how other people see, you know, the Sunday law history. Um, do they see the Sunday law imminent? Do they see, you know, that the Sunday law is going to come with the next president who's going to be elected, whether it be Trump or someone else? Um, you know, so we can have all kinds of speculations about it, but my view is that we need to just study. I, I don't think it really matters what we think at this point. I don't think that we can draw solid conclusions, even if we have opinions about things. Until we've looked at everything, I don't know how we can we can we can really draw a conclusion. I mean, I have a, a belief that I think that we were in, in saying that Trump needs to be president, that, that that to me is jumping the gun. Right. That's to me, recognize not recognizing where we are in the lines. Now, if Trump ha happens to be the one who brings in the Sunday law somehow, that wouldn't mean that I was wrong in saying that we were jumping the gun and drawing a conclusion. My view is it doesn't have to be Trump because Trump did fulfill in our line the role that he needed to play. If he happens to 
be the one that brings in the Sunday law later, that would that's that's not necessary. That's all I've said all this time. I don't think that it's going to be Trump because it doesn't have to be Trump. But this is this is not me with a final conclusion on the matter. This is just my you know, whether you want to call it instinct or intuition, just based upon what we have studied already, that would be my conclusion. I don't know. What what do other people think about this? I think there is a lot of prophetic symbolism that has not yet been completely correctly applied within this chapter. Okay. Well, definitely there's more that we have to see. And we've, we, we've made mistakes on, on some of the things that we've tried to understand. Yeah, for me, I do think there is something significant about Trump. That uh, there is a lot of prophecy uh, type connections with him. Mm-hmm. Well, and, we have uh, all those, the symbolic numbers dealing with Trump and 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 everything, right? So yeah, so we would all agree that there's something significant about Trump. Yes. So. I think it is good just to have a bit of caution concerning making too much of it, but just to sort of uh, wait and see where the Lord's leading us yeah. in our uh, prophetic understanding. And yes, as you say, just to study and to see see what the Lord reveals that maybe would have a have a clearer understanding concerning Trump. But yeah. Or not, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Well, Trump definitely is a prophetic uh, person. I mean, we, we have him in our line. He is Xerxes, right? You know, the question is, he is, is the mighty king that shall stand up also representing Trump in some way in connection with the Sunday law? So in conversations with Colin, he was saying, well, the issue of Greece has to do with the speed in which the events occur, right? Which is not how I initially understood what Colin was saying. So to me, this seems, this is something that I've only heard within the last few weeks that it had anything to do with uh, the speed. That's why he brought in Greece. Because um, my understanding, especially in the initial presentation, a mighty king that shall stand up, that this is still the United States and that this is still Trump. That's the way I understood it. But I still have a hard time taking that the mighty king standing up has anything to do with Persia. To me, what I understand is that Persia, Greece, Rome, and Babylon all uh, prefigure, they all prefigure aspects of what's happening at the end of the world. So, so when I look at Persia, I would start over again. That is, you know, I would have this line of the first three kings and then the fourth. But when we get to verse three, because that's kind of where we're, we're at here in our study, we would have to, we have to create a new line. Right, because we have the three kings and then the fourth. That's a line. So, a mighty king standing up. One is we see this, um, you know, doing according to his will. What is that symbol? Dictatorship. Okay, but but we see it in connection with. 
the papacy, right? You know, you go to Daniel chapter 11, verse, um, let me see, uh, 36, the king shall do according to his will. So, so if we look at that, we know that that's the papacy, right? Yes. So, so to say, well, you know, that must be the papacy again. I mean, it must have some relationship to the man of sin. Um, so, the, the, you know, the verses where we see this, um, you know, De Daniel 11, um, verse 16, he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, 36. Um, um, let me see. Uh, Daniel 8, right, talking about, um, uh, where is it here? Well, anyway, dealing with the little horn, and I'm just trying to see if it says do according to his will in here, I can't remember. Um, that's God's will. Anyway, we, we see that, that symbol um, doing according to his, his will, dealing with the Antichrist power. Now, so, I mean, I'm not sure how, if there's different ways in which we can look at this. But did we pray? can't remember. Yes. We did, okay. I just, I don't remember praying. Yes, we did pray, come to think of it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yes, so so when we look at this, this whole, um, you know, how we're going to sort this line out, uh, I'll bring this up here for some reason, I don't have it open. Um, So, so we finished off that line dealing with the three kings and the fourth, but what we haven't been able to do is to address Artabanus and um, and Artaxerxes, right? So I'm just going to go back here. Let's look at this. So this is the three kings and the fourth. So we can see that there is these three kings, and that's going to be the first, second, and third angels' messages. And then we have the fourth. Now, when we have the fourth, we have a new line, right? That is, we should be able to take Xerxes, Trump, and create a new line just like we have this line here, correct? Should be able to. Okay. So, so if we have a line of Trump, um, you know, we'd have to figure out how we create that line. Now, one of the ways that we could do that is um, we can take, um, I'm just trying to think, uh, just hang on a sec here. Because when it talks here about um, the four, the four shall be far richer than they all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. So, that brings us, I believe, to the story of Esther. Right? That if we want yes. to try 
So if we want to understand Xerxes, and we have to go by what's in the scripture of truth, we have to go to the story of Esther. Now we know the story of Esther happens after the book of Daniel. And, and we had asked that question before, how can Daniel, we have this according to the scripture of truth, when these events haven't happened. But we know that the Bible is a prophetic book and that God knows, the angel knows, Gabriel knows, Christ knows, that these scriptures are going to be written and they're written for us. So we can look at the book of Esther and say, this is the story of Trump, right? Because since Ahasuerus is Xerxes and Xerxes symbolizes Trump, if we want to, if we want to understand Trump, we would need to understand this message, right? Uh, the book of Esther. And we know that that addresses a type of the Sunday law. But is it the Sunday law? What do we mean when we say that something's a type of the Sunday law as opposed to being the Sunday law itself? So one of the things we look at, when we look at Esther, so let's just look at Esther chapter 1. It came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this, this is Xerxes, right, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over an 107 and 20 provinces. So you have 127 provinces. What is the symbol there? Well, you have 120 days to the midnight cry, or sorry, to, yeah, to the midnight cry, and then 70 days. Okay, so you could look at so it. 10 days in the month. Right, so, and, and we're going to see the, that with the 180 days and the seven days too, right? Okay, the other thing that yeah. we would have is in reverse, it would be July 21st. Right. Which is a symbol of midnight as well. Okay. So There's also, we, I think that's, that's the yeah. last number as well in the book. So it's kind of like the end from the beginning. Um, okay, you're saying, what are you saying about the last number in the book? Yeah, I think it's the previous chapter, chapter 9. You scroll okay. down the bottom. Well, so chapter 9. Um, you're talking about like 9 verse 30? They sent the letters unto the Jews to 127 provinces of the king of Ahasuerus with the words of peace, peace and truth. So you're just saying it's yes. the last number re represented in the book of Esther. There's no other numbers. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's mentioned initially, and then it's, it's uh, mentioned okay. at the end as well. Okay, okay. So you have... Brother Theodore. Yeah? I don't mean to interrupt, but this is a... You got a humming and a... Um, Humming on your side, or is it humming, or um, it's making the noise? How's that? Is that better? That is. Yeah, that is. Okay. Yeah, I just switched microphones. Okay. Um, okay. So. So we have this, this symbol, which we can attach to the midnight cry. We can attach, or to midnight, we can attach it to the midnight cry and the whole period of the 187 days, which we already have in the book of Esther. So we can take this into our history, right? That is, the, so when we look at the line that Jeff has, 
We have 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. Have we come to midnight yet on Jeff's line? No. Yeah, so we would have to say no, right? Now, we've had in our history way marks that we've marked as midnight, but we understand those now to be uh, zoomed in lines, right? Now, yeah. a person, so a person could argue that um, that we have passed midnight. That is, we can look at January sixth, twenty twenty one, and say that's Raphia. We could say that's what Raphia was about. It's the king of the north and the king of the south, and the king of the south is going to conquer the king of the north. And and I would say that is correct. But the question is, is that the raffia on the line that we mark as midnight that is on this big line of Jeff's, right? So somebody might argue that that, that is midnight. And the next thing is Paneum. That's going to be when the king of the north conquers the king of the south ultimately, right? And so we could say in the United States, that's the king of the north is going to be the Republicans. They're going to conquer the king of the south, the globalists, the Democrats. And and at that point, we have the midnight cry, and the next thing is the Sunday law. So, I, and I think that's where some people are in their thinking. I'm not sure if exactly that's what Colin thinks or not. But if if that's the case, then, you know, we're further along this line than I think. But I don't believe that that is the raffia that's talked about, that that's the midnight uh, on that bigger line that Jeff has. And we saw that when we went and studied um, the book of Judges. We could create these lines and we could start to see that, that, we're, that there is something ahead of us still that we would mark as midnight. And we don't fully understand it yet. We don't know what exactly that event is. And we don't have a time for it. That is, we're not, we don't believe that we can predict the time of those events. And, and this would be where some people differ as regarding what the, the dates and the time mean in our lives. So I would think overall that what we've, we've done in our study is that we've taken the position, um, these dates that we have in the future are symbolic. They may be connected to events, but we can't say what those events are. But we know that time has still been with us. Um, and a good example, of course, is the 187 days from July 18, 2020, to the selling of the School of the Prophets, and and other things that symbol that are symbolized there, such as the 18.7% uh, sale below the asking price. So, you know, you have these symbols, and we've had other kinds of symbols. Obviously, um, the Thanksgiving date in uh, 2022 and the 2,688 days, and of course, obviously, April 5th, 2030, these dates that are in the future. But we're not, we're not putting those dates as some kind of limit or some kind of time. We can just see... They symbolically represent something. If time goes on, they might end up having some significance. But that would be because, you know, we haven't done our work yet. So, <clears throat> so anyway, when we look at Esther, we can see that this is Xerxes and that this brings us to the time that we are in. That is, we are in the time approaching midnight addressing midnight right that's what this this that's what we've been experiencing but we know we're we're sort of more in what we would call the prediction before midnight if, if we're going to look at july 18th as the prediction before midnight july 18th 
1844, three days before midnight, were in Samuel Snow's letters, were in that history. So that's what I've believed for a long time, right? So I had a hard time um, thinking that a Sunday law, would, for instance, I didn't have the idea that a Sunday law is going to come on December 25th, 2021. But I knew that as we pass through our history, whatever was going to happen, it would lead eventually to a Sunday law because we're in the last day events. We're in these, these lines. We're passing over the ground of fulfilled prophecy. And past events are reflecting light forward uh, to our path. Okay, so it says in verse 2 that in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia, Media, and the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. So remember, Shushan the palace, that's going to be um, in Daniel chapter 8. Right. Right. He's going to be in. I was in Shushan in the palace. So that means Daniel is brought to the future and we can definitely connect that to um, the book of Esther. Right. I would think so. So so that history ties us to Darius. Um, um, we know that we have Darius is going to be the first one who builds, in my understanding, historically, Shushan the palace, Darius the Persian. And then we're going to see Xerxes in that same place. So when we deal with this Shushan, the 7,800 is the number for Shushan. And... Um, Uh, you know, we know it's called Susa in, in Persian. So that's going to be in the book of Esther and in Daniel 8, verse 2. So you're not going to see that, that word, Shushan, in any other place in the Bible. Right? Um, um, I think it's, been, it's not in Nehemiah. He, um, in in Nehemiah, no. So Shushan is, that word Shushan, 7800 is no other place. Now I'm just going to look it up as maybe another number, right? So maybe it is, I'm going to look up Shushan, and that's going to be in Nehemiah 1.1. 1, 1. And so I'm not sure why this Concordance doesn't show it that way because it is the same number. Okay, so it's in Nehemiah 1.1. 1, 1. It's in Esther uh, uh, 1, verse 1 and 2. And um, it's in Daniel 8, verse 2. So I'm not sure why they do that because it's the same number there as you, you, if you can see that little tiny number. Um, hmm. So why does Strong's Concordance not have it listed? Hmm. I have no idea. Anyway, it's the same. It's the same word. So it is in Nehemiah one one. Okay. So, so we have this Shushan the palace. We follow Miller's rules. We look at all the places where this is. And, and it's always Shushan the palace. Right? Maybe I shouldn't say it's always that, but I'm pretty sure. Shushan the palace, Shushan the palace. Shushan the palace. Um, oh, they have one. But the city of the city Shushan was perplexed. And in Esther 8, and is given at Shushan to destroy them. Um, present in Shushan. So it's not always Shushan the palace, but most of the time it is. Right? Yeah. Sometimes it mentions it just as Shushan. When somebody's in Shushan, in the city. 
Okay. <clears throat> now the point is this word, so the Shushan, the palace, doesn't exist in the Bible. The first time it's mentioned is in connection with Xerxes. But, and, and we're going to see it with Nehemiah. But, but Daniel talks about it. So when Daniel's talking about it, he's obviously taking in vision into the future, right? That's what we've, we've come to understand, that he's not, he's not um, in the province of Elam. He's in uh, Babylon, and he's taken off into vision into the future. My view is that he's probably there in 457 BC, but he could just be in that. Just It just means that he's in the Persian period, which is why he's not addressing Babylon, not because Babylon doesn't exist, and it's not like at the end of Babylon, because this is like 19 years before the end of Babylon. So, so he's here in, in the future, and, and that would tie us to the book of Esther, right? So, so we can't ignore the fact that um, Xerxes is at Shushan the palace. Now, what's the significance then of Shushan the palace? So uh, the number is 7,800. Do we have any other things about Shushan that we can, we can we do the gematria on it? Yeah, I think it means a lily. A lily? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and um, yeah, I've connected, connected it to being like a trumpet because a lily, the shape of it is like a trumpet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like a... Uh, uh, the province of Quebec, well, they have the fleur lis but it's kind of reminds me of that. Okay, so we have, uh, it's like a trumpet. Okay, what else? What about the 7800? So Shushan, the palace, the reverse sum is 271, which would relate to um, 217 or July 21st in, in a sense, right? Just a different order of those numerals. Okay, so 7800 itself is um, one of the, the factors is the number 13. So it's 13, uh, so it's uh, 2 to the power of 3 times 3 times 5, five to the power of 2. So it's um, 8 times 3 times 25 times 13. Twenty four times twenty five times thirteen is another way of looking at it. And it's two hundred and sixty months which is uh, 21, if we did it as um, so 21.66666 um, years, or you could do it as 21.7 years. So again, you'd get the July 18 symbol from Shushan, right? 
21.7, if we rounded it up, the 0 0.6 up to a 0 0.7. Does that make sense to people? show you here 390 times 2 okay um, so that would 390 times 2 would be 780 but yeah so 390 times 20 would be 7,800. But just to see what I mean here. So if we take this number, 7,800, and we divide it by 360, we get 21.7. That is, if we rounded it up, because you got 0.6 going along there. But obviously, if you round it up, it'd be 21.7. So if you did it to one decimal point, you'd have the 21st of July as a symbol, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, what about the third year of his reign? So what's the significance of the third year? Any significance in third year? You know, so we have this trumpet, we have the midnight cry symbols. Now we have the third year. We've done studies on the third day and the different thirds. Can we apply that to this a third day? If the third year being mentioned in First Kings chapter 18, I think, or 19, concerning the, the 1216 days, the three and a half years, but it's expressed there as the third, third year of the famine. Yeah. yeah, so it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came unto Elijah in the third year. Okay, so you can attach to the third year, you can attach... Um, the 1260, right? Now, really, I mean, if you count a third year, too. Um, uh, now, we know that uh, now Darius came to to his his um, Right, because he's so Darius. That's uh, the predecessor of Xerxes. Uh, Darius is going to be on the tenth day of the seventh month, September 29th. Um, he's going to be made king. Right, that's because he's going to kill false Smyrnas. Right. Now with Xerxes, we have also this symbol of because the tenth day of the seventh month, the 187th day of the year. And we're going to have tied to Xerxes here with this 180 day feast and the seven days that follow the same symbol. Um, so that means, actually, my belief is that that feast where he calls in Vashti is on the 10th day of the seventh month. And that in some way, uh, Xerxes is honoring that date based upon 
the events of Darius when Darius came to reign. Um, because you have this Akitu festival, which starts on the first day of the first month. Um, and it's going to go to, uh, you know, there's different, there's discrepancy because, you know, I've read lots about the Akitu festival and you get different stories from different sources, exactly how it happens. Because this is, is actually an Assyrian festival, uh, which the Babylonians observed and which the Persians observed and actually even continued on past that period. That is, it's, it, it's, it's a Babylonian festival. So who is ever in charge of Babylon seemed to observe this festival. It's, it's, it's just what they did, right? So it's like a very popular festival. It's the main festival because it happens in the spring, it happens in the fall, and it parallels um, the idea of the Passover and the Day of Atonement. So it's a counterfeit of the true. Um, so when we deal with this third year and we deal with the July 18 symbol, right? We can see that the prediction before midnight is three days before midnight, right? That was something that was established by the studies done by Blessings which Tabo pr promoted. Um, and he used things like the three days at the River Ahava, the three days of um, the Butler and Baker's dreams, right? And there's other periods of three days that he addressed as well. So the question is, if we're going to take Xerxes as being Trump, what, where are the symbols placing Xerxes? In what history? Well, Trump's third year. Okay, so Trump's third year. Okay, that's another thing that we looked at. And Trump's third year is? Well, we connected it to 2020. Yeah, and how did we do that? Well, we connected that uh, Xerxes had an ascension year. Okay. So his right. third year, Trump doesn't have an ascension year. Right. So, so we, Trump's okay. Trump's third year would then sort of be like uh, equivalent to, well, Xerxes' third year would be equivalent to Trump's fourth year. Right. Okay, so people understand what he's saying. I have a diagram of this I can show you, what, what at least what I had done with it. Um, no, it's coming up here. I got, and I'm searching Trump, which of course is not a good word to search on my slides. Ah, here it is. Okay, so in this slide here, <clears throat> now this is how I did it, and, and I don't know if this is the, the way that you're thinking of it, Stephen. But basically, we have um, the anointing of Trump. I put it as January 20, 2017. I don't know if you would do it that way. Yes. And it's going to be the, now I put the 10th day of the seventh month in 486 BC. Now, now, I put that there uh, because I'm taking a position that even though Darius, it, it is Darius who actually becomes king on the 10th day of the seventh month, that since Xerxes is acknowledging this date in the fourth year of his reign, that that, that somehow is connected, that some way that date becomes to him a symbol and that he celebrates that as as connected to his history so so obviously he's i don't believe that you know he becomes king on the 10th day of the seventh month in 486 bc but that's what i have there as a symbol right and then the first year is going to begin in the spring now in this case i put january 20th 2018 so technically from the way that we would look at this line that's how I would I would do this. So I would say the first year 
is so we're doing like um an accession year dating right so the first year is his accession year and then like that's the accession year and then you have his first year starts in 2018 his second year in 2019 and his third year in 2020. then you have 180 days right if you look at the top for xerxes and then you have the kitu in the fall um and then the seven days okay so july 18 2020 lines up with that that's that's how i've done it i don't know if that's the best way to do it but this is it, how, how would you do this Stephen? i mean this is something i drew way back when i was first looking at this yeah i think i was quite similar except i didn't specify when i just said the ascension year yeah i didn't specify okay. when it actually began yeah but if we did as this accession year dating trump then would be um that would be his third year 2020 in this in this sort of scenario however we would do it whether we would put january 20 as the way to mark that or not i don't know but anyway that's that's what i did okay but you can see how how we're thinking of this line that the third year refers to what we're saying is that what's symbolized here is July 18, 2020. And the question is, where does this place Xerxes? It places him in our history, right? That is, this story is in our history. Now, the story that's going to be here is that um, if this is Trump, then um, this event, Queen Vashti's refusal, is July 18, 2020, because it's the 187th day of the year. Does that make sense to people? We're not going to go through detail of, of Esther because we've done it before. So. Yes, it takes place. Okay. After 187 days. So, yeah. You have a July 18 symbol. Right. Now, in this history, Xerxes is stirring up all against the realm of Grisha, right? That's what this whole feasts are about. Yes. Okay. So, so this agrees with what we already have understood about Trump, is that Trump is in our history. He's going to stir up all against the globalists. But in the midst of this, there is this, uh, this story about Vashti, and it's going to fall on the 10th day of the seventh month, the 187th day of the year. And in some way, however we want to look at the details of it, it relates to Trump during that time. Now, in that time, July 18th, so here's where part of the problem lies in interpreting this. So we really have, have more than one story in the Book of Esther. We have this initial story about Vashti, about him stirring up all against the realm of Grisha. It doesn't give us the account of him losing to Greece, right? Because the next thing you're going to see is in um in what year i can't remember what year this is in next uh, in the seventh year yeah it's in the seventh year that's what i was thinking that, that's the next so, year I mentioned yeah so the next one's going to be in the seventh year and so when we looked at this history when we were studying esther we found that this aligns with history that is uh this esther and and this this queen here we, we could equate, I can't remember the name of, of uh, Xerxes' wife, but we could equate this with a person in history, um, whether that's the actual name that, that's given in the Greek uh, writings or not, we don't know. But the point is, uh, we can equate this with a queen that he got 
after he came back from losing to Greece. So he's going to lose to Greece and he's going to come back. And after he comes back, he's then going to pick a new queen, right? And this is the story of Esther. So it doesn't tell us about him losing to Greece. And you can see how that lines up with what we see in Daniel. So in Daniel, we have Xerxes the fourth, right? He's going to stir up all against the realm of Grecia. But that's all it tells us. And same in the book of Esther. It's going to tell us about what he's doing because that's what he's doing. He's That's why he's having these meetings because he's getting uh, financial and military support to go against Greece. That's historically what he's doing. Now he's going to lose. Now, why doesn't it tell us about the loss? Why is it just giving us that part of the story? And then this new story in Esther, same in Daniel, it doesn't even tell us anything about Xerxes. It's going to jump to Alexander. So how do we account for that? What, what would that mean? You know, and again, we, we've looked at this in detail. We looked at the spirit of prophecy. We read it in the Apocrypha. So what do we do with this story here when we get to Esther? So when we get to the story of Esther herself, it's going to start in chapter 2. And what did we see about Esther? We know the story of Esther is the type of the Sunday law. Could did we tie this this history with our history? And how did we do that? Does anybody remember? I mean, this is a while ago. Is this the, the church and state? Okay, well, there's church and state involved, but we, we tied it really directly to our history, to dates in our lines. Okay, so, um, and to July 18th, right? So, um, let's see if I can find these line, lines that we drew. Okay. Now, there's lots here in this line. So when we took this, I know there's all of this uh, history here. So one of the things that we had done is we had connected Amalek and Agag, who's an Amalekite, right, to uh, Haman, right? You remember that? And what was the significance of that? Why was that important? Because Mordecai is descended from Kish, so we had gone back through this. Saul is a Kish, right? A guy. Yeah, because uh, Saul. So in a sense, then okay, had consequences then in the time of Xerxes. Right. So, so what Saul's failure brings about this consequence. So, how do we relate it to to us? Because it doesn't really show that on this line. Well, there's that quote from Ellen White. She says that the, the Millerites had continued on, except at the third angel's message, the Lord would have came ere this. Okay. In a sense, their failure therefore had consequences. But maybe to our time. Okay. 
So, so definitely it's going to, it's going to tie into our time, right? Because of these, these types of parallels. And there's a lot more to it than that. But, but just on, the, on a simple level, we can say the failures of the Millerites to some degree, uh, show this failure of Saul. And, and then the consequences come later. But we have this repeat of history. Now, uh, the part that to me is, uh, of greater significance is that we addressed this whole history of Xerxes. So we had Xerxes' accession to the throne, the first, second, in the third year, there's going to be this feast. It's on the bottom line there, 180 plus seven days, right? So it's in 483 BC. And then uh, it's going to be a few years later that the Persian campaign against Greece occurs. And then um, in the seventh year, Esther is going to be crowned. And it's going to be in the 10th month of the seventh year. So we have a symbol of 107, which is the 10th day of the seventh month. Even though it's the 10th month, seventh year, we still get that symbol there. And then we're going to have uh, later, we're going to have this issue that comes with the decree, right? So then I took the the decree the 13th day of the first month and the decree goes into effect 13th day of the 12th month and then um, I put that all on the line to the first day of the first month April 22 473 BC all the way from the first day of the first month in April 5th 474 so like the story that we have in Ezra we have a history that covers roughly a year now so I'm just showing the year there, right? It's going to cover this year. And then you're going to have, uh, they do this casting of lots. The decree is given on the 13th day of the first month. That's April 17th, uh, 474 BC. And then you have these three days. And then you're going to have um, the first banquet and then the second banquet, the 16th and then the 17th. Mordecai is going to be honored, Haman hanged on the 17th. Then you have 66 days going to Esther's decree, which is the 23rd day of the third month. And from that first banquet to the decree going in effect is 323 days. So it's the symbols of the 23rd day of the third month. And um, June 25th, it's going to be from June 25th to March 7th. Uh, 256 days, and you can see that's the 25th day of the sixth month, the June 25th date. So you, you have all of these symbols just like we would have in other lines. And uh, March 7th is the date. It's going to be the 13th day, the 12th month, the 12th year that the decree goes into effect. 13 times 12 times 12 is 1872, as we know. And March 7th is connected to the Sunday law right in 321 so i went through all that pretty quickly but but we can see how this becomes a type of the sunday law now we mark march 7th in our lines in what way so what happens on march 7th and what's the significance of it in our lines So in our history, it's so March 7th in the past, in our history. We're going to start a study on March 7th in 2022, right? Or is it March? No, pardon me. March 7th, 2021. And that's going to be the study of examining the foundation, right? And March 27th, or March 7th, 2021, is 1,700 days from March 7th, 321. 1,700 years, I mean. People understand what I'm talking about. Is anybody not clear? I'm not, not expressing myself well. So we have the first Sunday law is March 7th, 321, right? We know that this Sunday law on March 7th in 473 BC is typifying that Sunday law. 
right? It's also typifying the Sunday law in our history. But because it's March 7th, we, we would see significance in that, correct? Okay, so it's going to be 793 years from March 7th, uh, 473 BC to March 7th, 321. What's the significance of that? So 793 years. Is there any significance in 793 years? If you multiply it by 360. Okay. And then half it. And then half it. So you, so you take 793 times 360 and you divide it by two. Yes. And then divide it by two again? No, no, just, and then if you add one, if you add 1260, it gives you 144,000. Okay, plus 1260. Okay. I don't know okay. if that's significant, just, just but, Okay. Now, um, so, so it, it connects in some ways with, uh, now, now the, the part that sticks out to me that's probably not going to stick out to other people. Um, but the length of a month on the Jewish, the Jewish, um, the Jewish calculation of a month is that they have, um, uh, the Jews have 12, uh, you know, 24 hours in a day like we do. And they have the same day that we do, but they divide the day into parts called helic, right? So there's 2005. 25,920 parts in a day, right? And so when they give the length of the month, it's seven, six, five, four, three, two, plus one parts. Now we can turn those into, uh, because a part, one of their parts is three and a third seconds. So, I mean, you can turn that into minutes and seconds. But when they're going to de de um, describe the length of the month, they're just going to say it's seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, three, two plus one parts. Now we we would describe the length of the month, and and this is in the time uh, uh, ancient times because the month has become slightly shorter by you know uh, parts of a second. But they had it as twenty nine thousand. Or 29.530594, right? So if you take that calculation, they will have that. We have it as 29.530587. Some people have it as 88. They round it up a little bit. Um, but that's the length of a month. Now, if you put that into hours and days, hours, and parts, it'd be 29 days, 12 hours, and 793 parts. So when I see that 793 years, I think about the MOLED interval. I think about the length of a month. So, you know, it could just be a coincidence that those numbers happen to line up, but, but I don't think they are. Now, if you take 793 parts, multiply it by 3.3 and a third seconds, you get 
2,643 and a third seconds. So that is you get one part, that is you get 2,640 plus one part. So that's 44 minutes with uh, one part remaining. That is three and a third seconds. So uh, do people follow, can you follow what I'm talking about here? There, I'll, I'll show you this here. Okay, so this is my paper on the molet interval. So the molet interval, 765432 plus 1, and the Hebrew division of the day into parts. All right, so that's the, the paper. And if I go here, so I'm just going to read this here, and then maybe you can we can see how this relates. Uh, there's some uncertainty about how the molet interval was derived, right? So it's a period of 765432 plus 1. It's equal, if that's the number of days, that would be equal to 25,920 months. Um, and um, now this relates directly to the length of the month, which is 765432 plus 1 helicine, each helic being uh, 25,920th part of a day. This allows us to meaningfully express the fractional part of a length of the month as, and that part's not important, but um, if you look at the fraction, um, it's 13,753 over 25,920 parts. Um, that is, if we divide the month, 765433 three parts, by the parts of the day, 25,920, it equals 29,000, or 29.530594. We can multiply the remainder, um, 0.530594 by 25,920, which equals 13,753 parts. That is, a month is 29 days plus 13,000, 753 parts. And this can be reduced to 29 days, 12 hours, and 793 parts. That is 12 hours is half of 25,920 or 12,096 parts. 793 parts that remain would be 793 times three and a third seconds or 2,643 and a third seconds. So one of the things you see here that I didn't really explain in the paper is if we had 2640, we would have that number 264 times 10, right? That, and we also know that that's going to be uh, that period of time, the 88 months, 88 months is 2,640 days, right? So that's going to go from January 11th, 2023 to April 5th, 2030. So you can see this, just this one little part left over. So if it was 793 parts or 792, it would be exactly uh, 2,640 seconds. Now, of course, we can reduce this to 44 minutes with three and a third of a second remaining. That is, um, so the length of the day is 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and three and a third seconds long. The length of a month, I mean, is 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and three and a third seconds long. So this is a pretty precise measurement. Now, can we relate this 793 years to this symbol, and if we did, why would we do that? Why is that significant? If I have that 793 years from March 7th, 18, uh, March 7th, um, 473 BC to March 21st, 
321 AD. Is there any significance in this 793 being connected to that, that period of time, 2,643 and a third seconds? Are people following me? Does that make sense? What would it mean? How does that tie into our history? Why, why would it be significant? I mean, to me, it's significant. I know why I think it's significant, but I want to know why you would think it's significant. So think about this history. We have March 7th, 473 BC. We have March 7th, 321. And we have March 7th, um, 2021. So we're going to have uh, 793 years, right? And, and I'm going to see that MOLED interval number that's dealing with the length of a month. Uh, it's going to be 44 minutes and um, three and a third seconds or 2,643 and a third seconds. And I'm going to see that that relates to this number that I got when I looked at the MOLED interval. And I know that it's going to be 1,700 years from March 7, 321. So these are both Sunday laws. But we're going to begin a study on March 7, 2021 on examining the foundation. So why is that significant? Should we uh, have any, see anything in it? Or am I just uh, out to lunch here? Okay, so let, let's look at the period of time. So the period of time that we have there is uh, 24,093 years. Is that significant? You said 23,490? No, uh, 2,493. I don't... <laughs> 2,493. Yeah, I, I don't know what I said, but it's 2,493 years. That is, you're just simply taking 793 plus 1,700. So we go from March March 7th, 473 BC to March 7th, 2021. It's going to be 2,493 years. Does that give us anything? You cite it being 27 years less than a uh, 2520. Okay, so so 2520, it would be 27 years less. So that's one thing we could see. So there's maybe a symbol there with the 27. I don't know. Um, we we if we divide it, if we look at its its factors um, or its divisors, uh, one of the divisors is 277, which is a symbol of July 27th. Another one of its divis divisors is 831. And that is 831 is um, related to Palmoni, right? It's got the digits of Palmoni. So, but we wanna just see that it's connected to our history. So that somehow this period of time 
ties us to this Sunday law. Now, if we go to our time, what's the significance in 2021 that, re that relates to a type of a Sunday law? Is there anything in our history that, that we could connect other than starting a study on March 7th, 2021? Okay, so Iran says that that is um, so you're saying that the March 27th is uh, in 2021. How are you doing that? What was the question? Well, you just have their 20th day of the ninth month or 1225. What, what is that? Why did you type that in? I thought it was a question about the Sunday law in 2021 or something. Oh, okay. But yeah, I'm just asking about March 7th, 2021. Yeah, so we do have a symbol of the Sunday law in 2021. That's going to be December 25th. But in 2021, we begin the study on examining the foundation on March 7th. Do... You know, so that's just a date. It, a it, was that, um, wasn't that the bombing at the, um, in, you know, bombing? That, I don't know if bombing on March 7th, 2021. I was talking about 1225. In 2021? Yeah. No, that's in 2020. Okay. I know. I just, do we have anything on that date other than a symbolic date in 2021? I don't know of anything, right? So I'm just asking if people do. <clears throat> so the question is see because what i connect this this history to is um is to the history of what was happening during the pandemic so i'm going to look at uh Haman as representing uh, a deception was was Trump deceived by Haman? Zero what you mean? Yeah, well, I'm saying Trump. I I'm mixing the two together. So, yes, obviously Xerxes was deceived by Haman. I'm just not saying what Haman symbolizes. But would Trump be deceived by Haman, whatever Haman symbolizes? Right, Jay? Well, yeah, so we could say that, right? You know, and I'm not saying it's necessarily a person, but definitely – of the counsel that he received, what was happening, um, and, and then who's going to be persecuted, right? Because we look at the pandemic and the mandates that happened even during the time of Trump, even before, you know, Trump loses the election. Um, we, we compare those two. Now, part of the problem here that we would look at is if we look at Xerxes, we have the first story of Xerxes, where he stirs up all against the realm of Grisha, and then he's going to lose. And then we have this other story, 
But these stories are parallel. Would we agree with that? That we don't just take the story of Xerxes and run it in a straight line. That we take the first part and the second part and we lay them over top of each other. That is, they're illustrating the same history. They're illustrating two different things that happened to Xerxes. So this is what we're going to look at. We're going to try to sort this out um, tomorrow and the days following. Because this is an important part of the problem that we have to sort out. We have to understand, where does this story of Esther come to play in our history? We know it's a type of the Sunday law. And, and, and it, so it's describing the Sunday law that's future. Right. We would agree with that. Now, so we could look at this as, well, the first part represents Trump and he loses to the globalists. But then he comes back and he takes this woman, makes her queen. And then you're going to have this Sunday law come and that's going to be Trump again. Right. So you could interpret it that way. Or we could say that. Both of these things have already happened in connection with Trump. That the story of this deception and this Sunday law has already happened in our history as a type. People understand what I'm what I'm saying. So we're going to further look at Xerxes. We're going to further look at Trump and try to see how we take Trump and match him up with Xerxes. Does that seem fair to people, what we're doing? Does this seem like a fair examination that we need to look at? Yes. Okay. So that's what we're going to do for the next couple of days or so. Okay. Well, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we've had here this morning. We know that uh, there's much we don't understand. And we're trying to sort through the best that we can. We ask that your Holy Spirit continue to help us in our personal study. We know that there are differing views um, and that our views are incomplete. Um, they're sort of scattered. And the study has been scattered to some degree. But we know, Lord, that you are leading and we ask for your continued help. We pray for each person that you can help them as they seek your face. And may your angels watch over us throughout this day and bring us together again according to thy will. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.